My personally most hated console must be the Philips Video Pack, or for the American viewers, the Magnavox Odyssey. You had to be completely bored out of your socks to even power it on. Well, that was the case for me anyway. Yet there is one game on the system that always grabbed me. An excellent two-player game called Stone Sling. The concept is simple. Each player has a fortress and a catapult used to fire at each other. If you manage to destroy the fortress of the opponent before yours is turned into a pile of bricks, you win the game. Stone Sling was my first acquaintance with the so-called artillery game genre and it was the first one released on a home console. The artillery game is one of the oldest computer game genres around. During the 70s, these games were completely text-based, simulating artillery entirely with input data values. Even before the computer era, people were playing these types of strategy games, but then they were known as pencil and paper games, with its roots dating back to the 1800s. A good example of a more modern interpretation is Battleship from Milton Bradley. But anyway, back to computers. During the 80s a ton of these artillery games saw the light of day on any system imaginable. 8-bit, 16-bit, you name it. But it wasn't until the release of the MS-DOS sharer game Scorched Earth when a set of rules for the modern artillery game were set. In Scorched Earth, players controlled tanks to do turn-based battle in two-dimensional terrain, adjusting the angle and power of each tank turret before each shot. The game featured numerous weapon types and power-ups, and is considered the modern archetype of its format, on which popular games like Worms, Hawks of War and Angry Birds are based. But what about the ST, you might wonder? Well, we had our share. In 1994, the brothers Irvine released an unofficial remake of Scorched Earth for the Atari ST, using their Chimeric Desires label. And in 96, we even got a Worms clone. Battlezone, created by the Gower brothers, was actually really good. But the game we're talking about today is a very special one, dating back to the early days of the ST. And probably the most famous monochrome public domain game on the system ever. By some considered a cult classic. Friends, let's get started. This is the history of Ballerberg. In December of 1986, Eckhart Kruse managed to get his first demo named Grafik und Sound Demo on the cover of the German SD computer magazine. He was so proud. But Eckhart's journey into Atari computers began way earlier, in 1982, at the age of 13, when his father brought home an Atari 800 as a Christmas gift. Two months prior to receiving the Atari, Eckhart already started reading books about the basic programming language and was writing programs on paper, which he was now able to test. It had really absorbed him by then. But soon he learned that basic was way too slow. So he dived into machine language for the 8-bit 6502 processor. As he had no assembler software, he simply typed the 8-bit numbers of the CPU commands as long lists of data. By 1985, he had written two games for the system. The first one being Busenspiel, a stock exchange emulator. And the second one was an adventure game called Abenteuer in Scotland. By the end of 1985, it was again his father who financed their new computer, the Atari ST. It was an obvious choice, as both Eckhart and his father played keyboard, so the MIDI music interface was very attractive. Because there still was very little software available for the machine, and most of it being very expensive, Eckhart started programming his own version of 68000 assembler in SD Basic. Once this was done, he used that version to write an even better version of assembler. He wanted to explore the sound capabilities of the ST, and with his final version of assembler completed, he wrote the program Musik Editor. Eckhart explains, he was especially proud of his ID to very flexibly edit vibrato, glissando and other effects by breaking down the musical bars in 196 portions, which could be individually set. But it wasn't enough. He needed to create a showcase of what could be done with his new music editing software. 
So the idea for an animated demo was born. And by November 1986, the Grafik und Sound demo was finished. Graphics were created using Neochrome and all music was made with his own tool. Eckhart remembers it was especially fun to sing the music with the actions of the band. The people from ST Magazine were so impressed with it all, Eckhart won the first prize in the music competition and his demo made it to the cover of the December 1986 issue. A few months later, in February of 1987, a second demo was released, called Grusel Demo. Another really fun title, with ghouls and ghosts dancing to one of his groovy chip tunes. The demo was cool, but the impact wasn't as big as before. Grafik und Sound Demo was one of the very first releases on the ST. A great example to show the graphics and sound capabilities of the machine in its infancy. And these days, it is considered by many an absolute cult classic. In the course of its lifespan, the Atari ST was promoted differently depending on the region it was sold. In France and the UK for example, the ST was considered a games machine and came in some absolutely legendary packs with numerous classics. This was in stark contrast to Germany and the Benelux, where Atari aimed for the business market and serious software. And for these tasks, the ST was capable of displaying a high resolution of 640 by 400 pixels in monochrome and was bundled with the SM124 monitor. Eckhart loved the monochrome mode of the ST. And because the SC1224 color monitor from Atari was still very expensive and monochrome was predominant in his home country, for his next project he would focus on the ST high resolution. In 1987, while still in high school, Eckhart was thinking of his next project. He remembered a simple artillery game on the Atari 800 and wanted to make something similar, but better and with a lot more depth. And around the same time, his parents bought him a C compiler. He started work on Ballerberg. The game was completely programmed in C and finished in one month, working every single day after school hours. Ballerberg was a two-player game, with the second player being either human or computer controlled. As in classic artillery game tradition, there are two kingdoms separated by a mountain. Winning the game is accomplished by either killing the king with a direct hit or by ruining the opponent's kingdom. But there's so much more. There's a choice of various castles and each castle has multiple cannons, a storage room, gunpowder, cannonballs, money and a vein. So not only do you have to adjust the fire angle and the amount of gun power before taking a shot, you also have to take wind into account, which changes direction and strength after each turn. Because Eckhart was always interested in strategy games concerning money and markets, he even added an economy system into the game. In Ballerberg you can earn money by raising taxes or by building derricks. This money can be spent on gunpowder, cannonballs, you name it. But keep in mind the price changes after every turn. Raising taxes also changes morale of your people. Unhappy people will abandon you and join the enemy. Ballerberg was released as public domain. If you donated 20 German marks, which is the equivalent of 12 US dollars, you would receive the extended version of the game, the complete source code, and a description on how to create your own castles. Eckhart received 160 donations of the requested amount. In the end, Ballerberg remains one of the most famous monochrome games for the system. An absolute classic and a highly addictive two-player game. After Ballerberg, Eckhart created two more monochrome games. Unternehmer was a simulation where you had to manage a factory but the game never got finished. And finally, we had Spaceball, a future sports game which simulated pixels with true grey color by letting pixels flicker between black and white with 35Hz. But in the end, it was Ballerberg that led this unforgettable mark for so many Atari ST fans. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoy the show and remember, stay Atari. Bye. Whoa!